there, is, uh, there are a few small exercises that you can do with uh, what we learned yesterday. <coughs> there are very few things that can be done easily and analytically in hadron collisions because everything is very complicated. But for example, as we discussed, if one looks inside the proton at a sufficiently short uh, resolution time scale, you can in fact find he quarks heavier than the proton itself. And in principle, this can be calculated uh, analytically uh, because the charm quark, say, or the bottom quark are sufficiently heavy that we can just work using perturbative QCD. So you can just go through the, the equations that, 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 we, that we derived yesterday for the evolution of, uh, of quarks inside the proton. And in the case of, uh, of a heavy quark, the boundary condition is that for Q below a given scale, there is no heavy quark. So you have to look at the proton with a resolution with which is, of course, smaller than the scale of a heavy quark mass bef before you see any of those heavy quarks. So the boundary condition is that the function, the PDF of a charm, say, is equal to zero at the charm mass. And from that point on, you use the alterelli parisi equation. So I will leave it to you as an exercise, which is worked out in all of the details in this slide. Uh, to extract uh, uh, the result that will be <coughs> that's given there. So yesterday we talked about the evolution of the initial state, what happens to the proton as it approaches the collision. That's the first part of the factorization uh, expression. Today we discuss what happens to the last part, namely the evolution of the quarks and the gluons that were produced uh, towards uh, stable physical hadronic states. So that's the evolution of the final states. And to make life uh, simpler, since we are dealing with evolution of a final state, we look at uh, a framework, an environment in which there is no complication coming from the initial state. So we're looking at E plus E minus going to, to hadrons. And what we'll discuss today is how we model the evolution of the quarks and the gluons and their transition to, to hadrons. The, the first thing that I'd like to remind you is, uh, and wi which I hope, I, I count on the fact that you've been exposed to these uh, already in some of your uh, courses, is that uh, at large center of mass energy in the plus E minus system, uh, there is uh, an equivalence between uh, the cross section for producing hadrons and the cross section that you can calculate for producing quarks and gluons. In other words, once the quarks and gluons are produced, they will automatically turn into hadrons with probability one. The evolution will be unitary. So you just have to worry about uh, the probability of producing quarks and gluons as free particles. So at leading order in perturbation theory, we know that <coughs> what that predicts, uh, the, it's a purely electromagnetic process because E plus E minus go to a photon or a Z boson but then decays to quarks here at three level, there is no QCD involved. So what this cross section counts, counts the number of uh, flavors that are accessible, the energy that we have in the initial state, and counts the number of colors, which is how many quarks of a given flavor we have. And that of course is equal to three. So that if we replace quarks with muons, we get exactly the same expression up to the factor of color and up to uh, the charges of quarks being slightly different than those of muons, and we have this famous R ratio <coughs> given there. If we are working around uh, uh, energies where the Z is uh, relevant, this has to be modified because, of course, the coupling of quarks and leptons to the Z are not exactly the same as those to, uh, to the photon. Now, <coughs> This can be improved by going to higher orders in perturbation theory. We can include, for example, the first non-trivial order in perturbation theory with the emission of a gluon from the final state or the exchange of a virtual gluon. And it turns out that at the level of cross-sections, what happens is that relative to the Born term, the cross-section changes by a term which is equal to alpha s over pi. For example, if we are working at the z mass, this is about a 3% correction. So the emission of one gluon is really a very small, uh, is a very small uh, correction. Now, the appearance of alpha s, which depends on, on the center of mass energy uh, in this expression, is such that if we look at this 
expression e plus e minus going to hadrons as a function, uh, and we look at electron beams of varying energy, we can monitor the behavior of alpha s, and what we find are these data points given here, which very well agree with uh, the prediction from the running of alpha s, uh, which is uh, given analytically uh, in, that, uh, in that figure. So overall, the scheme is perfectly, is perfectly consistent. Now the question though is to which extent the mapping between uh, partons and particles holds beyond the pure observation where the cross-sections agree. In other words, if we're interested now in studying the momentum distribution of the particles that come out of, uh, of a collision in the hadronic final state, or we want to know how many particles are coming out of a collision in E plus E minus, can we still rely on, on these uh, equivalence of partonic and, and hadronic, uh, and hadronic uh, rates? Now, to establish that there is a connection and which connection is there at all is crucial because, uh, you know, we're looking, for example, at the gluino. We're searching for a gluino. We know how the gluino decays from the Lagrangian. It goes to a quark, a squark. The squark decays to a quark, plus a neutralino. So again, we're talking about quarks. And, you know, we base our search strategies on uh, the kinematical correlations, for example, that will exist between uh, the particles coming from the decay of, uh, of, a BSM, uh, of a BSM particle. If the hadronization process, the transition of these quarks into real uh, uh, pions, protons, were to completely screw up all of these kinematical correlations, we, you know, we wouldn't know what we should be looking for, right? So it's absolutely crucial to maintain at some level this, uh, this relation. And it's not obvious that this is the case because uh, if we look at uh, the structure of, of the final state in E plus E minus, we immediately notice something which is quite surprising. I told you that uh, in perturbation theory, if we go from leading order, which is two quarks, to next to leading order, which is two quarks plus one gluon, it's only a 3% correction. If we add a second gluon, so we have a four-body final state, uh, the correction is another relative uh, one to 2%. So the final state appears to be dominated by, you know, two, three, at most uh, four particles, partons. But if we look at how many real particles, pions, kaons, etc., come out on average, from any plus and minus collision, say at 90 GV, so in the decay of a Z boson, this is the multiplicity distribution of charged particles. So this is in units of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So on average, there is 21 charged particles, plus of course, by isospin, there will, be, there will be the neutral ones, and there is a tail all the way up to 50. If you look at how many final states there are with two or three particles, you find practically zero. So you know, how can we possibly think that a, calcul a perturbative calculation that tells us something about uh, QQ bar pair plus possibly one or two gluons can have anything to do with the reality, which is a final state with uh, 20 particles? That, that is the first puzzle that we have to, to address. This, as I say here, this appears to jeopardize any hope to use particles to learn something about the initial properties of partons. On the other hand, if we go and we look more closely at the structure of these final states, what we see is that uh, there is a memory, there is a resemblance with uh, the partonic picture, because we will find that most of the events have actually this structure. There is, uh, indeed, uh, there are many dozens of particles, but they tend to be clustered into two streams, what we call jets, recalling against each other. So here, the two-body final state, even though it's not a two-body final state, it does look like there are two objects eh, in the final state. And occasionally, at the level of few percent, so consistent with the perturbative calculation of a cross-section, the contribution coming from QQ bar plus gluon, at the level of few percent, we do find events in which particles now are grouped not in two, but they are grouped into three streams. And this stream, you, you see that all of these tracks here are curled. 
and that's because typically there is a magnetic field inside the detector. So that means that even particles which are coming out uh, very close, if they have opposite charge, they will be diverging and moving in opposite directions. So these clusters, these jets, typically look broader than they actually are at the production simply because of the effect of a, of a magnetic field. So, but, but they really tend to be pencil-like. So this is what uh, solves, uh, at least uh, at the level of looking at pictures, but there is no formalism yet, the problem. The whole idea is that we have to associate, if we want to maintain this uh, relation between uh, mm, perturbative objects, uh, Lagrangian uh, uh, states, and uh, physical uh, states, we have just to associate partons to collimated jets of hadron. So the idea is that a quark or a gluon will evolve into uh, a jet of, uh, of hadrons. And the way this happens is what I will uh, dedicate uh, most of these lectures upon, on. Now, th th this is not uh, obvious a priori because uh, there could have been a different, uh, <coughs> a different uh, outcome. In fact, before jets w w were uh, really uh, proven experimentally to exist, several people working on, on QCD since the very beginning, they were arguing that, uh, in fact, the final state should look much different because the plus and minus goes to QQ bar. QQ bar start, you know, <coughs> recoiling against each other. On the other hand, the overall momentum of the system is equal to zero, right? Because it's a plus and minus in the center of mass, so they go. As they get further and further away, strong interactions become very strong, so we cannot take these quarks uh, infinitely away from each other, and at some point we build up uh, enough, uh, enough uh, mm, uh, potential energy that the system will just bounce back. And you can imagine that then these quarks will start bouncing back on each other, and we can as, you know, develop uh, a state which has perfect uh, spherical uh, symmetry with these quarks bouncing back and forth in the way as they bounce back and forth, they will emit radiation, but all of this radiation may be emitted and distributed uh, with, with, uh, with, a spherical, with a spherical symmetry. That is a possible outcome that was, uh, that was expected, the uh, so-called uh, fireball uh, model of, uh, of final states. That clearly would have taken away from us any possibility of using quarks and gluons to do any search for new physics or any, any study of, uh, of particles. So, in order to understand uh, how this picture emerges in, in a quantitative uh, way from, uh, from the theory itself, uh, we have to start from the basic, namely from the first emission and see what happens when a first emission is, uh, takes place. So, we, we start from the simplest uh, a virtual photon going to QQ bar, emitting a gluon, so that's the first uh, emitted radiation, and you can write down uh, exactly the matrix element for this, uh, for this process, and I encourage you to do it as an exercise, although everything is worked out explicitly, but you can try to reproduce yourself uh, the calculation. And what we find is the following. We find that uh, there are two poles that develop in this matrix element, one corresponds, of course, to this propagator, and one corresponds to the anti-quark propagator. And these poles are of the form P dot K, where K is the momentum of a gluon, and P and P bar are the momentum of a quark and the anti-quark. So the place where these denominators go to zero, of course, are import is important because that's what will enhance the value of the amplitude. So the kinematics of the process will be driven towards the point, of course, where the amplitude is uh, the largest, and that corresponds to these going to zero, or in other words, to uh, the <coughs> intermediate uh, quark and anti-quark going on shell. There are two ways in which P dot K can go to zero. You can write it out explicitly like this. One way is to have uh, the emission angle of a gluon relative to the quark or the anti-quark uh, go to zero, so one minus cos theta, and that's so-called uh, collinear singularity. Or you can have the energy of a gluon go to zero, K zero goes to zero. Now, collinear emission does not alter the global structure of a final state because it preserves its pencil likeness. In other words, if we have a singularity with a gluon being emitted collinear to the quark, well, the final state is exactly one of the final states that we are 
we are looking for from, from, from the picture of jets because the quark goes collinear with the, the gluon goes collinear with the quark. Also, if you consider that any uh, measurement apparatus will have a finite resolution, cannot really look infinitely close to just the quark, but we have, you know, from the point of view of geometry and also energy resolution, some finite size. Because of color conservation, in QCD color is conserved, the system of a quark or a quark plus a gluon after the gluon was emitted are totally indistinguishable from, from, from one another. Because of course, the moment the gluon is emitted, there is a conservation law that conserves the color, the energy, the momentum, everything, right? So there is no way we can actually separate and tell and distinguish these two, these two states. So the emission of a collinear gluon creates absolutely uh, no problem. I mean, it preserves uh, the directionality and therefore the association between the momentum and the kinematics of a partonic state with what will be the kinematics of a hadronic state, given that this gluon that's been emitted itself uh, will uh, evolve into, into pions. The other <coughs> region where the amplitude uh, uh, grows, that corresponds to the so-called the soft region where the energy of a gluon is small, is much more delicate because if we have a singularity when the energy of a gluon goes to zero, that gluon could be going anywhere and still the amplitude would be, would be enhanced. Furthermore, when uh, when the gluon goes at large angle relative to either of the, either of the quark or the anti-quark line, the interference effects between the emission from the quark and the emission from the anti-quark will be, will be important. And a soft gluon finally takes away color because it's a colored object. So if soft gluons were to go wherever they want, uh, we would be dispersing color into the final state. And we know that at the end of a perturbative evolution, all of the colors have to be rearranged in such a way as to generate color singlet states, because hadrons are color singlets. And if in order to rearrange the color, we have to go and get these gluons all over in phase space, you see we're really scrambling up completely the kinematical structure of the final state. If we separate the color of one object from the object that carries the anti-color so that we can form the color singlet between the two and we separate them significantly in phase space, at the end of the day, by having to bring them together, we are going to entirely change the kinematical structure of the event. That's what I was saying before, this fireball, uh, fireball uh, scenario in which uh, radiation goes all over and at the end uh, we, we have a fully symmetric and spherical uh, topology. So the understanding of soft emission, the properties of soft gluon emissions are, is what is crucial and critical to understand the structure of these final states. A and that's what therefore we will study in more detail. Now, a nice exercise that should be doing at least once in your life is to prove that in the soft limit, however, this amplitude simplifies, simplifies dramatically. And it simplifies by factorizing the Born amplitude, namely the amplitude for the photon going to QQ bar, times an overall factor, which is called uh, the iconal factor. This you recognize as uh, a classical current. This is what you would be writing down if you had a classical electric current radiating a photon of uh, polarization vector epsilon and momentum, and momentum k. It's a particle which goes from having momentum p to momentum p bar. There is therefore a, an acceleration and that induces uh, uh, Bremsstrahlung and this is uh, uh, the factor that describes uh, that radiation. So this factorization is very similar to the factorizations that we, see, we saw yesterday in the context of uh, collinear emissions from the initial state. When there is a factorization, there is an indication that we are separating uh, physics at different scales. And here there is a factorization because we are dealing with uh, a soft gluon, therefore a gluon of long wavelength. But in the limit of long wavelength, this object cannot really uh, resolve what is happening in the hard collision because it has a long wavelength. It cannot see what, what, what's, what's happening inside. And if you cannot see what's happening inside, it will only see what's happening outside, namely it will only be sensitive to the external states. 
but by not seeing what happens inside, it means that the expression that describes the probability to emit uh, this uh, soft gluon has to be independent of the specifics of, of the hard process. And therefore, there has to be a factorization. There has to be something that doesn't depend on the hard process, and what depends on the hard process should all be collected into a single expression, which is uh, the hard process bone level matrix element. So this is why there is this... Uh, uh, factorization. So once again, as was the case yesterday in the description of the parton densities, it's exactly this uh, separation between different time scales that simplifies our life by introducing this uh, uh, factorization in separation. Now, as an exercise, there are uh, other, w this was a specific example and you could argue that maybe if we do a more complicated example, then things will be different, although the physical argument of a long wavelength uh, should uh, somehow uh, tell you that it will not be the case. In particular, for example, since a long wavelength gluon is like a classical object, uh, clearly all of the Dirac ology has to go away. The expression should be completely independent of the spin of the particles involved, whether it's a scattering of fermions or vectors or scalars, shouldn't make any difference because the spin is a quantum mechanical uh, entity and a classical gluon cannot care about, uh, about the spin. And that's again why all of the Dirac algebra disappears from those complicated expressions. It's all collapsed down into the three-level Born uh, formula. So, but you can, defi you, you can derive the Feynman rules for the emission of a soft gluon by simply writing down uh, for example, uh, a transition between the creation and the annihilation of a fermion and the emission of a gluon in the limit in which the gluon is soft, and then you can write down and you can obtain uh, the Feynman rule for the emission of a soft gluon from, uh, from the fermion line. You can look at the Feynman rule for the emission of a soft gluon attached to an external line uh, engaged in a hard process, and the overall factor is this p dot epsilon divided p dot k, which is one of the two elements of the iconal current that we had in the previous slide. And you can also try to see what happens if we <coughs> emit a soft gluon from an internal line. This internal line means that it's off shell both before and after, and you will see that if we inject, if we eject uh, a soft gluon, the amplitude has no singularity. All of these amplitudes here, well, this one, for example, there will be a singularity when, when the gluon energy goes to zero, this is, this is finite. And that's, again, another statement that uh, a soft gluon, of course, does not like to go and peak inside a process, right? Because it's got a wavelength, so the, the probability that the deep guts of a hard process emit a soft gluon is, uh, is, uh, is suppressed, and that's expressed by this relation. So this you can prove yourself as an exercise and what you can do also as an exercise is to try to apply, <coughs> is to apply these soft gluon emission rules to simplify, to try to do some approximate calculations of what otherwise are relatively complex uh, uh, matrix elements. For example, you can study the scattering of electrons or quarks in the small t uh, region and small t means that there is a small uh, momentum transfer, therefore a small energy, and even though this gluon is of shell, you can try to apply the soft gluon emission rules to easily calculate the diagram, and you will see that in fact, to the extent that you apply properly the symmetric, uh, symmetry properties of the initial and final state, in the soft gluon approximation, you're going to get exactly the result, the exact result that would emerge from uh, the full uh, precise calculation. And you can do, that calculation would be trivial anyway if you wanted to do exact, but if you start doing things like quark gluon scattering, it becomes a bit more complicated because there is an non-abelian vertex, etc. But I told you that a soft gluon doesn't care about whether it couples to a fermion. It doesn't care about the spin of a particle it couples to. It only cares about the momentum. That's the only thing that, uh, that it can see. It can only see the current. And therefore, this vertex uh, becomes simplified, and it's just uh, the iconal vertex, 2p mu. You put it in, and you do your calculations, and you get an expression which is not exactly, which is not equal to the exact uh, expression. It's missing out a small component, but you can prove that it's numerically 
equal to the right, uh, to the exact expression at the level of 20%. And same you can do it for glue glue to glue glue. So these are all small exercises that you can do, that you can do yourself. Now that was a photon going to two quarks, but typically in, uh, in a hadronic collision, we have more complicated case of a gluon uh, decaying to two quarks or a process in which in the shower there are both quarks and gluons. So <coughs> one has to look at what happens in the case of emission of soft gluons for these more complicated uh, cases. So here, relative to the previous analysis of a photon going to QQ bar, we have to attach the gluon not only to the two final state quark and anti-quarks, but we also have to attach the gluon to the initial state. And here we have uh, a more complicated uh, uh, structure because if you look at this process from the point of view of uh, currents, before we had a photon that was neutral going to QQ bar. So the only current, color current, was the one with carrying the color of the quark into the anti-quark. Here we have a gluon going to QQ bar. And the gluon, as you know, you can look at as a quark-anti-quark -quark pair, so as a color-anti-color -color line. So in this process, we actually have two currents, and two color currents. And each of these color currents can by itself become an emitter of a gluon. So the factorization in this case will be a contribution coming from the emission of a soft gluon from one of the two currents plus the emission from the other current. It's as if uh, you were looking at electromagnetic radiation, not from the motion of a single electron, but you had uh, a system of electrons, several electrons or protons or charged particles moving around, and each of them emits uh, independently its own uh, soft, uh, <coughs> soft, uh, soft uh, photon. So you can work out using the soft gluon emission rules, which are universal, they're given in the previous slide, you can work out the expression of the amplitude in, uh, in the soft limit. And the bottom line is uh, the following, that you can group it into two terms, as I said before, one which contains uh, the iconal factor describing the emission from, uh, say, the anti-color current line that starts from the gluon. So there will be a contribution of a gluon emitted from the initial state gluon, but from the anti-color part of the gluon, plus the gluon emitted from the anti-quark. And then there will be a contribution coming from the emission of the, of the second current, color current. So the color line of the gluon emitting a gluon, and the quark in the final state emitting, emitting a gluon. Now, what is interesting, you see, <coughs> by doing that, uh, we separate uh, two processes which are really uh, separated now. And uh, when we do, and this is at the matrix element level, as we do the cross-section, we take the square, we will see in the next slide that these two processes are orthogonal in, uh, to the leading order in, uh, in one over n. In a string language, it would be like saying that when we take uh, the square of this object, it's a planar process. When we take the square of this one, it's a planar color configuration. And when we take the interference between these two soft emissions, what we have is a non-planar one. There is a twist, so we lose uh, two powers of, of n. And this you can do explicitly by just uh, taking the sum, the square, and taking the sum over colors of the of the color of the color factors. The color factor square for each individual component goes like uh, n, <coughs> n cube, so n squared minus one times Cf, while the interference goes like n, so it's suppressed by one over n squared. So the result of this is a very important statement. But to the leading order in one over n C square, the emission of a soft gluon can be described as the incoherent sum of emission from the two color currents. Now, why is this interesting? Because, as I was mentioning yesterday, one of the big difficulties that we are facing when we are trying to describe these states with, you know, 50, 100 uh, large number of particles is 
you know, the idea that to do it correctly, we may have to calculate an amplitude for 50 particles and take the square and take into account all of the possible interferences, right? That obviously would make it entirely impossible because there is no way we can do anything like that. So the only way we can circumvent that is if there is something built in uh, into the theory that allows us, but in a rigorous and controllable way, to describe somehow separately the evolution of different branches of a final state. Say we go E plus E minus goes to Q, Q bar. And then if we could take the evolution of a quark as something that evolves that proceeds independently of what, happen to the uh, what happens to the anti-quark, our task would be simplified. We emit a gluon, and then we go on on the anti-quark, and we look for the probability of emitting another gluon. Then we can build up, say, a Markov chain process, which is a sequence of probabilities. So we can use probabilities as opposed to amplitudes in order to describe uh, uh, the final state. And at that point, we would be able to describe uh, the evolution in a probabilistic way. If every time we emit a new gluon from one of the final state particles, we had to go back and check whether this gluon interferes with the rest of the event, it would be a disaster, right? Because then we would really have to calculate a 50-body amplitude, a 50-body matrix element, which is, which is impossible. So here, we have an understanding of why, at least at the level of independent color flows, we are allowed uh, to 1 over n square, and then of course one has to argue whether that accuracy is good enough, to factorize the emissions. Once we identify in our process what, which ones are the color, uh, the color flows, then we can treat them separately and just uh, talk about uh, emission probabilities. Now, <coughs> within uh, a single within an individual, uh, um, let's call it sub-amplitude, describing emission from a given uh, color current, there are still two diagrams because we have uh, two particles which are color connected and each of them has its own uh, diagram for the emission of a soft gluon. Since the soft gluon can go at any angle, typically at any angle relative to these two, there is no collinear enhancement and therefore, generically, both the initial and the final leg will, uh, will contribute. Uh, so if we do, again, want to have a probabilistic uh, uh, evolution, we need to find a way in which we can separate emission from the initial and from the final, and from the final state. And this is, uh, again, made, it made possible by the so-called uh, angular ordering. The concept of angular ordering is the following. When we're dealing with uh, soft radiation, we can uh, take the sum of these two diagrams and the square of the amplitude can be separated into the sum of the squares of individual amplitudes, namely either the initial or the initial state uh, emitting, this incoherent sum, and the interference between the two, which is the, the part that you know, introduces uh, coherence, the interference between the two can be accounted for in a purely geometrical way by noticing that the emission outside uh, these cones is suppressed. In other words, if we have this final state uh, current, gluons can go everywhere, but then we can describe the emission of the gluons as the emission from uh, this line with a positive definite probability, but confined within a cone which is obtained by drawing the other line around the emission line, plus a similar contribution which is emission from the other, from the other line again confined within this cone. Emission outside, for example, a gluon going in this direction, it's outside, well, going, say, in this direction, which would be outside either of the two cones, is suppressed. Is suppressed because it's a soft gluon, so there is no soft gluon, soft gluon enhancement. 
So this is a, a, a result that can be obtained rigorously by doing the calculation. There is a slide I have with a full calculation and, and you can try to, to reproduce it yourself. It can also be understood uh, in, a, in an intuitive uh, uh, way and the basics of, of, of this argument is still the same as before. <coughs> if I have, let's say I have a photon that goes to QQ bar or a, to an E plus E minus object, if I look at this E plus E minus system with sufficiently low resolution, so with a long wavelength uh, photon or a long wavelength quark, I cannot separate the presence of two individual charges inside the system, okay? Because the total charge of this system is equal to zero. And by having a charge equal to zero, it cannot radiate uh, long wavelength because from far away, we see it as a dipole. There is no charge. So it's only the hard radiation, radiation with wavelength of the order of the size of a system that I can tell that there is two charges. Otherwise, I will not see it. And that's the sense of angular ordering. So angular ordering confines the soft radiation to be within these two cones because then I'm sufficiently close to my system that I, can, uh, I know that there are two separate charges. If I have emission at a large angle, automatically I will not be able to separate the two and therefore that emission has to be, has to be separated. So here there is a, a, a proof uh, uh, of angular ordering based on simple quantum mechanical arguments and again I leave it to you to, to work it out uh, in, in, in deep for yourself as an exercise but it's, it's very simple and the physics argument is the one, the physical argument is the one that I just, uh, that I just gave you. So in the bottom line, once again, is that when I have uh, a pair of, uh, say, quarks, in other words, a color line, emission of soft gluons has to be confined within, within a cone, has to, be con has to <coughs> come at an angle which is smaller than the angle separating the two. In other words, it has to be within a cone, within the large cone drawn by taking that line around uh, the core. And this is the formal proof uh, of angular ordering. So what we've achieved now is the following, that we've taken the most general process in which uh, a final state, uh, some state uh, with the uh, gluons going to QQ bars, well, we could have taken gluon splitting into glue, glue, and we could have gone through exactly the same arguments and the result would be, would be the same. So even though in this process there is several Feynman diagrams, but uh, to the leading order in 1 over n square and for the emission of soft gluons, the sum over these four, three, four Feynman diagrams breaks into an incoherent sum of probabilities, of positive definite quantities, which describe the emission by an individual line and the interference, the coherence of the emission between the different lines is accounted for by this angular ordering. Having split this uh, complex amplitude into square, into the sum of positive definite terms of probabilities, allows each probability attached to the emission from a fixed, a given line in our process, allows us to build a purely probabilistic uh, algorithm to develop uh, the evolution of, uh, of the system. So, <coughs> and one of the consequences of this is, uh, is, uh, is the following. Let's take, for example, again, let's say we have a photon that decays to a QQ bar pair boosted. This quark will emit the first gluon and it can do so the only uh, interference, if you wish, with the emission from the other one is due to the angular ordering. So the angle of emission here has to be smaller than the angle between the quark and the anti-quark. The emission of this gluon now will define a new pattern uh, in uh, the color, a new color uh, current, because at this point the gluon will be taking away the color of the quark and the anti-color of the gluon will be given to the quark. So now this quark will be color connected to this gluon and this is now the color current that will emit uh, the next gluon. So we can sit on this quark and calculate the emission probability of the next gluon. 
and the next gluon to be emitted now, we have to fulfill the angular ordering dictated by the relative position on this gluon and the quark. So that ang this angle will be smaller than that angle and therefore will be much smaller than the original angle. And then you go on and what you achieve is that each subsequent gluon emission will be at an angle which is smaller and smaller. So as this quark evolves and the jet develops, this jet will be self-collimating because all of the radiation will just get squeezed down to smaller and smaller angle, okay? So with the exception of a first gluon that is emitted pretty much where it wants, when we have, uh, say, a Z going to QQ bar, the first photon goes where it wants and that's the first gluon goes where it wants because angular ordering poses no constraint since the quark and the quark are back to back. But the moment that gluon is emitted, everything else has to go into either the direction of the quark or the direction in the anti-quark, and there is this uh, self-collimation. <coughs> of course, configuration with a third jet arise because of radiation of, of a hard gluon. The hard gluon does not have to obey the uh, angular ordering, and that's how we obtain free jet final states. But it's a hard jet, so being a hard jet, it means that we can do a perturbative calculation to describe the probability of emitting that hard jet. So we don't have to worry about, uh, uh, about the, 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 the evolution of, of that system. We calculate the matrix element for the configuration QQ bar plus a hard gluon. And at that point, we take that configuration and we will let it uh, evolve towards uh, lower and lower uh, virtualities and scales. So the other thing which is important here is that this uh, self-collimation of a jet uh, leads to what is called uh, pre-confinement. In other words, by maintaining the gluons always within uh, a smaller and a smaller cone, the system ensures that we are not taking color very much away in phase space. We are not separating color anti-color pairs in phase space. So pairs which are connected by color and that therefore will form uh, the seed for our color singlet hadrons are maintained close in phase space precisely by this evolution in which the jet uh, is uh, self-collimating. Uh, and uh, we will see later how important this pre-confinement uh, process is. Now, the other thing which is important to point out is uh, the following. The, rel the, the reason why it's extremely important to take into account these coherence effects induced by interference between uh, different matrix elements but accounted for in terms of angular ordering is the following. Let's suppose that we, we developed our, our, our shower, we emitted several gluons, and then as a result of evolution from this leg, we have this final state with one, two, three, four, five gluons and the quark. If we were to apply a purely probabilistic approach to the emission probability now from this configuration for the next gluon, without any form of coherence and correlation, we would really be making a big mistake because we would be coming on this gluon and we would say, what's the probability of this gluon to emit something? And we would let it emit. Then we come on this gluon and say, what's the probability of emitting? And then we would let it emit. And we would be doing this for all of these gluons. And this would be wrong because the total color of this final state is actually equal to the color of a single quark by color conservation because this system came from a single quark and every time a gluon was emitted, it was emitted in such a way that the color state of this uh, five gluon plus one quark is a color triplet. And a color triplet, of course, radiates much less than uh, five uh, adjoints plus a fundamental. Okay, so if uh, and the angular ordering is precisely what is preventing this uh, incredible growth of uh, multiplicity in gluon emission that would take place uh, uh, that would take place otherwise. It's a bit like uh, looking again in QED at uh, at the following system. We have an electron, and this electron, you know, radiates photons that go into e plus e minus pairs. And if I want to calculate the, 
the potential at some point far away from, uh, from this system. And if I were to do it, you know, by just summing over the potential of all of the individual charges, I would be making a big mistake. I really have to do the coherent sum of all of the contributions. And since all of the charge uh, alternates to the leading order in R, the leading term, E over R, the one associated with the charge, the only term that's allowed to emit uh, uh, lo long wavelength radiation, will be proportional to charge one, because that is the charge of a full system. So this is what will radiate. This will, however complicated this system, will radiate like a single charge. And then, of course, there are dipole terms that go like one over R squared, but those that will not be allowed uh, to, to, to emit uh, uh, soft radiation at large distances. Okay, so this is why it's absolutely crucial. In the early days of QCD uh, simulation of final states, uh, these color coherence effects were not taken into account and the predictions for the number of uh, gluons emitted and therefore the number of particles in the final state were completely off uh, compared, to the, compared to, to the data. So it was until this effect was, was realized uh, uh, there were problems. So, and now we put everything together and I will show you more or less what happens, how in practice we, we describe uh, the evolution from, from the beginning, from the hard process to, to the end. Now, to some extent, uh, this is not just how we do it when we calculate it, but you may argue that it's close to what nature actually does, right? Otherwise it wouldn't work. I mean, so, it's so we start from... Uh, <coughs> Let's say that we're interested in, uh, in a two-jet final state. Then we start by calculating the central part of the factorization theorem, which is the matrix element for the hard process, 2 to 2. If we were interested in Drelian in producing a W, then we would be calculating QQ bar to W. If we're interested in TT bar, we do QQ bar or glue glue going to TT bar. And we take that as a starting point. There is a factorization theorem, so it doesn't matter where we start from, and it's just a matter of... Uh, numerical efficiency to start from the beginning because that's the way that we can be guaranteed that what we're simulating is exactly what we're looking for. <coughs> for a given event, of course, that, that, you know, we'll be generating millions of events, each of them will have a different kinematic, so that will specify initial and final state momenta as well as, as, well as flavor. So this is a matrix element calculation. And then we develop the, the parton shower and we start, for example, from the evolution of a final state and we do it, as you saw, it appearing sequentially. So we start from one leg, we calculate the probability of the first gluon emission, the probability of the second gluon emission, which at this point will be totally independent of what happens in the rest of the event and will only depend on what has happened the step before because the step before will define the new of shellness, if you wish, of the process, the invariant mass between this quark and this gluon defines the of shellness of this quark and therefore defines the probability, uh, the phase space we have available for emission. And then the color line connecting this gluon and this quark defines the angular order in cone. So we emit this gluon and at this point, once again, we forget about the rest of the event and we move on to evolving this gluon or evolving this quark. At some point, uh, we get down to a virtuality which is uh, of the order of a confinement scale, of the order of a GV. We stop the evolution because we wouldn't know what, what to do at that point. We certainly cannot use the tools of perturbative QCD, so we leave it there for the time being and we'll come back to that uh, later. So once we dealt with one leg, we do it uh, with the other one and then we do it with the, with the initial state, uh, with the initial state uh, as well. At this point, we are done. All of the, if you wish, the acceleration that these particles underwent in the hard process has been uh, absorbed by the, uh, the radiation of, uh, of gluons. And the next step is to take now these uh, objects uh, to physical hadrons. So the first step is uh, to split uh, gluons into quark anti quark pairs. Now, the reason to do that is the following. In the shower evolution, 
the objects that will be most likely emitted are gluons, that's because they have a large Casimir, they have a, a large uh, color, so it's much more likely to emit a gluon than it is to emit, uh, to emit a quark. But with all of these gluons in the final state, we know that we should not take these gluons and put them together to form color singlet objects because what we would be getting are glue balls. A and we know that glue balls certainly are there in nature, but it's not the most likely object to come out. It's hard, in fact, you know, one can argue that they've they yet to be uh, really discovered, the glue balls. I mean, it, it's really not uh, the, 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 the fundamental, uh, certainly not uh, the lowest lying state in the hadronic spectrum. It's pions, it's kaons, uh, it's typically uh, mesons, q q bar, q -Q -bar pairs, which form uh, the spectrum and <coughs> of objects that we find in all of these final states. So the idea is that uh, as these gluons, at the end of the perturbative evolution, they start traveling away from each other, and as they travel away from each other, they build up, uh, of course, uh, a, a large uh, potential energy because of confinement, and what this does is uh, splits, takes this gluon into a QQ bar pair. So we do that by hand in a phenomenological way. We, we don't have uh, uh, a first principle uh, mechanism. On the other hand, a single, a single gluon going to two quarks, it's pretty much phase space, right? That there isn't really much that you can do. There will be some angular distribution perhaps, and one can try to incorporate that angular distribution of a QQ bar pair relative to the gluon direction as a phenomenological uh, parameter in this uh, phenomenological description. Having split the gluon into the QQ bars, now we have uh, a well-defined uh, uh, structure for the color flows, because uh, color flows we kept track of because it's what defined the, the, the color currents and what defined uh, the angular ordering uh, constraints. So we know, having went through the development of a shower, which particle is color connected with which particle. <coughs> Since we worked in the one over n approximation, because that's the approximation in which our factorization uh, uh, operates, we may assume that there is an infinite number of colors. In other words, every time uh, a gluon splits, say, into two gluons, the, a new color will be produced that wasn't there before. So at the end of the day, there is a unique assignment of color, anti-color in this diagram. Of course, if we work with, a, if we deal with a real case in which there is only three colors, because the NC is equal to three in real life, and we have, you know, eight quarks uh, and eight anti-quarks in the final state, there will be m more than one way in which we can connect uh, color and anti-color. There will be one red and there will be at least uh, two anti-red particles that I can connect the red quark with. But the procedure, and that is called color recombination. I, I, it's an, an add-on uh, that's added to these, uh, to, to these algorithms in order to try to make them more realistic and incorporate the possible effects of the finite number of colors. But typically we work with an infinite number of colors, so there is a unique way in which the colors can be assigned. And you see here the manifestation of uh, <coughs> the pre-confinement I was discussing um, uh, above, because color and anti-color, they're always uh, nearby. This particle will find the anti-color here, this will find the anti-color there. And what I do now, I just bring together color and anti-color and I form color singlet objects called uh, clusters. I bring in also the fragments of, uh, of a proton. And so these uh, brown uh, ovals represent pairs of color connected uh, objects. So there is no color in here, there is no color in here, there is zero color in there. And as you see, all of these uh, color singlet clusters are local in, uh, in phase space, except, for example, this one. In order to find the color partner of this object, I have to go all the way, trace it back to the initial state, and come, and come here. And that is unavoidable, because to the extent that I have a colored initial state and a colored final state, 
if I want to turn those to the initial and the final state separately into color singlets, I have to transfer some color from the initial to the final state. So that, that is absolutely unavoidable. The point is that I only have to do it in this case with one of these clusters, si color singlet objects <coughs> connecting initial and final state. Because everything else will be local. So once I take from the initial to the final state that minimal amount of color that's required to make the two separately uh, color singlets, I'm done. Everything else just I is, is local in, uh, in, uh, in phase space. And the next step is to decay each of these uh, color singlet clusters into pairs of hadrons. Now, why do I have them decay into pairs of hadrons and not go directly into, into a pion, for example? Well, it's, it's very simple because here you see, I take, for example, I make this color singlet cluster by taking a quark and an anti-quark from here. But this quark was coming from this gluon, the anti-quark was coming from that gluon. If I take the invariant mass of this QQ bar pair, I get an arbitrary number. I may get uh, 368 MeV, and there is no resonance corresponding to 368 MeV. So the only thing that I can do is to form two of these pions if I'm above the threshold for making, for making two hadrons. And the excess energy that I will have, say I put in 368 MeV, I can make two pions, that's about 240 MeV, and the energy in addition is just uh, kinetic energy. Again, the picture here that you want to develop is the one in which this now this QQ bar pair as a given amount of total energy, inclusive of the mass of the quarks plus the kinetic energy, they are flying away from each other. And as they fly away from each other, at some point, they hit a threshold in which uh, the, the, the potential energy that's built into the string exceeds twice the light quark mass. So I turn that potential energy into a QQ bar pair. And now the two, the initial QQ bars plus this QQ bar pair will form the two separate uh, uh, mesons. <coughs> If in my color singlet cluster I have uh, a di quark, I bring together three quarks as opposed to a quark anti quark, this of course has a baryonic number and therefore it will decay to a baryon plus a pion as opposed to decaying to, to two pions. So this is uh, the picture that I just uh, alluded to with, with my hands. This is the potential energy between two quarks as a function of the distance. I have the two quarks going away from each other. The potential energy grows. At some point, it hits the value of about two m quark. So what happens is that uh, a QQ bar pair comes out of, uh, of a vacuum. And then I have now the possibility of forming one and two. Uh, color singlet uh, mesons and the additional and at this point they, they, they are not strongly uh, coupled to each other they're not confined to each other so they can travel away and whatever is left uh, with the energy I had available goes into kinetic energy I can even produce baryons in this way if uh, you know, as I evolved, instead of immediately splitting into a QQ bar pair, the system splits into a QQ anti-quark, anti-quark pairs, a di-quark, anti-di-quark pair, and that's the way in which I can produce a baryon. Of course, here, <coughs> when, when the algorithm is, is implemented in practice, you know, here I could get uh, a UU bar pair, I could have a DD bar pair, so depending on, and, and you know, since they have the same, practically the same mass, they will come out 50-50. So <coughs> that is what will give rise to both charged and neutral pions. I could also create here an SS bar pair, strange anti-strange. Of course, that is less likely because there is a mass, but if I have enough energy in my cluster to start with, occasionally that will happen. I cannot calculate from first principles, although I could use, uh, say, some uh, thermodynamic or statistical mechanics argument. I can put like a Boltzmann factor, e to the minus the mass of a strange quark relative to e to the minus the mass of a d quark to estimate the relative probability 
surprisingly enough, these arguments are quantitatively um, turn out to be correct. They describe uh, quite well uh, the relative multiplicities of, of hadrons that come out. But in all cases, I can just consider it as being a parameter that I put in my model. All of this part dealing with hadronization, as I said, is modeling, does not follow from first principles QCD, except for some common sense uh, uh, applications. I mean, our intuition about QCD says that what we're doing here is reasonable, but quantitatively we need to treat these as three parameters, parameters which will be fit on the data. So this is uh, another way, another picture, this event is uh, a deep inelastic event in which a photon uh, hits a proton. You see the photon comes in, hits this quark. As this quark felt the photon coming in, uh, it had radiated a gluon, again the gluons we were discussing yesterday and that, you know, are emitted and they cannot be reabsorbed because uh, the quark has been kicked away, but this gluon is around. After the quark has been uh, hit away, it's been accelerated and therefore it will radiate, and it will radiate a first gluon, a second gluon, and a third gluon. As you see, the angle becomes smaller and smaller. That's the self-collimation of a jet, and these gluons will split into QQ bar pairs. So you see now, Again, this uh, effect of the, of the pre-confinement, that down here, all of the color singlet pairs are local and they are part of a jet. It's only the emission of a first gluon that engages color exchange between the initial and the final state because the quark coming out from the splitting, the QQ bar splitting of this gluon has to go to the initial state in order to find uh, its anti-color. But the moment this first gluon is emitted, you see the rest of the jet evolution is completely independent. There is no trace from this point on, after the first gluon is emitted from this point on, there is no trace of the color of a quark in the initial state. So the quark is produced green, emits a gluon, and from that point, he has no memory left of where he came from in terms of color and anything else. So it does evolve from this point on, the object evolves as a color singlet, as a color singlet object. All of the color goes in that direction. And that's why there is no major scrambling of the kinematics at the end of the event, because that jet is going. The only thing is about this first gluon, and this will mess up a bit things. Typically, if we look at the final state uh, in E plus E minus, we will see these two streams, these two jets back to back. But then at large angle in between the two, there will be some soft activity. There will be some few soft uh, pions, which are exactly the memory of this uh, transferring the color from one to the other. But the transferring the color from one to the other takes place early and it's a localized and it's low energy phenomenon in a sense. What do I say here? Yeah, I repeat, uh, yeah, it's written what I just said. Now, there is this <coughs> plot, which is quite interesting, and it says the following. When I, when I take these uh, pairs of color anti-color and I form these color singlet uh, clusters, as I said, they will have some, some mass. Before I said 368 MeV, so they will have an arbitrary number. Ideally, you would like that distribution, the distribution, the mass distribution of these clusters, first of all, to be focused at low mass. You wouldn't want this to be 20 GV, because if it were 20 GV, it means that inside I have a quark and anti-quark with relative momentum of 20 GV. So it's a bit early to hadronize. This object, ideally, should, should radiate, right? So I would like to see that at the end of the calculation, these clusters have indeed a low mass, peak towards the, the GV, number one. And number two, more important, I would like to see this distribution to be independent of the process I'm dealing with. Because as I said, the hard physics went into defining what is my final state. And at that point, my final state can evolve 
in the leading one over n square approximation and for soft emission, soft emission is what builds up the, the multiplicity of a final state, evolves in a way which, is, which factorizes. So it's independent of a hard process. But if it's independent of a hard process, then something like the distribution of these mass clusters should be independent of a hard process. So what this plot shows is uh, with distributions normalized to one, you only see one curve, but there is actually five curves of five different colors which correspond to the distribution of a cluster mass of color singlets for hadronic final states in E plus E minus at uh, 35 GV, 90 GV, 190, 500, and 1000 GV. So we, we go from 30 GV all the way up to 1 TV, and we look at the distribution of these mass clusters, and it remains exactly the same. Of course, if we go to 1,000 GV, there will be many, many more gluons being emitted, so the total multiplicity will be larger, but these distributions are normalized, are normalized to 1. So the difference between uh, a final state at 1 TV or at 100 GV is purely accounted for by the perturbative phase of the evolution, namely the emission, the shower emission, the fact there will be many, many more gluons being emitted. Everything that has to do with the hadronization will be exactly the same. What happens locally in each of these blobs is completely independent as whether we came from a collision at 1,000 GV or at 100 GV, okay? So again, <coughs> we have something similar to what we had yesterday in the case of the PDFs. We have some physics that we cannot control at a numerical level because we don't know exactly which numbers to put into here to describe uh, the relative uh, momentum share between uh, these two or the probability of having a chaos as opposed to a pion. So we have to introduce these uh, uh, model parameters. However, what we know is that this description of hadronization is universal. It doesn't care about what's the underlying hard process. And that means that we can take, uh, we can make a set of measurements. We can take one experiment, for example, the plus and minus collisions at 30 GV, and we decide that we use that experiment not to test our model, but to do measurements. And we do, we look at the multiplicity distributions. We look at how often there is chaos as opposed to pions. We look at momentum correlations between chaos, pions, and all of these, and we use that to fit uh, the parameters of a model. And once we fit the parameters in the description of a non-perturbative phase, we're going to use them at, for different experiments. We're going to use them in E plus E minus at 1,000 GV, and we can also use them to describe proton-proton at the LHC, okay? In the same way that the parton densities that we extract from deep inelastic, we're going to use at the LHC. Yeah, one small remark, just you know, to give you a picture of this. As I said, the gluon, the color of the quark is left behind with the first gluon emission, and then uh, there is propagation. So the color does not propagate physically. There is, it's not like the color of a quark as it was produced is moving towards the end. Every time there is a radiation, the color is left behind, and a new color is produced. So it's a bit like a polarization phenomenon. If you bring, if you have a dielectric, and you come close with a charge, then you will see a negative charge, you will see a positive charge appearing on the opposite side. But that's not because there is a positive charge that starts from here and travels all the way through. It's simply a chain of polarizations. This will polarize the atoms here, they will polarize it here, and then the polarization iterate, and the charge we see here is completely decoupled from, uh, from the polarized uh, atom that we had uh, there. So the evolution of the jet is exactly the same, uh, the same thing. Oof, oh gosh. There is a whole new chapter now. In well, I still have 15, 20 minutes, right? 15 minutes, so maybe I will... Uh, <coughs> this is the place where I would be making use of uh, the Sudakov ology that uh, Nima so kindly introduced, uh, saving me time. So th th this part is to show you in a bit more detail uh, numerically what, what happens, how the, the, the algorithm really 
clearly works. As I said, it's a sequential probabilistic evolution. We start from a quark, we ask the probability to emit a gluon, and then we continue and we never look uh, backward. What is, uh, that's what the Markov chain is. So we start from a given, uh, a given scale for our quark. We ask what's the probability that something happens at some other scale, and then the event generates the new scale, lower scale at which a splitting takes place. And from here we go on, this line gets split, et cetera, et cetera, until the scales become, uh, become small. So in the probability of each emission, since we are talking about perturbative splittings, depends just on perturbative QCD. So it's related, in fact, uh, to, the, um, to the splitting functions, the splitting kernels that we discussed yesterday in the case of initial state radiation. And the total probability of all possible evolutions is one, unitary evolution. That means that once I create a final state, I do QQ bar goes to QQ bar, and I attach the evolution, the total pro something happens with probability one. In other words, there is not a mechanism by which in the middle of a shower, the algorithm tells me, oh, sorry, you know, you should have never got here. This was not a good event to start with. You have to throw it away and take it away from the, from the cross section, right? Every time I generate some state, this will evolve with probability one into something. And what that something is, of course, will vary event by event with relative probabilities that are built into, into the, the algorithm itself. So the shower does not introduce so-called K factors. So even though it's a description of higher order processes, but it does not change the total probability of those events. If I'm looking at Drelian, so production of a W, I inject the matrix element for the W production at leading order with a cross section, that cross section is preserved. I will have, have I will describe all of the initial state evolution, possible jets being emitted, but the total number of events remains the same. So what defines the single emission? The single emission is uh, defined by uh, the, the kinematics, which is uh, starting from uh, an object which is of shell at a given scale, defining the scale at which it will, uh, it will uh, the scale somehow at which the parents, the, at which the, uh, the decay products will, uh, will emerge. And it will describe how the decay products, if you wish, the angular distribution of the decay products in the rest frame, or another way of saying it, is uh, the energy fraction carried by one of the two uh, decay products. And then there is an azimuthal angle in the case in which I have some spin correlations that, uh, that are relevant. And this is described by, of course, alpha over two pi. That's because it's a QCD splitting. In front dimensional analysis, there is a one over Q square, and there is a P of Z, which is exactly the same at, the, at this, at the leading order, it's exactly the same P of Z, the splitting functions that we had yesterday in the description of the PDFs. And P zero is an overall coefficient, which is just there to ensure that the sum of all of the probabilities, the sum over all of the possible histories at the end is equal to one, so that the evolution is, uh, is unitary. Now, <coughs> there are ambiguities here. For example, the Z variable could be described uh, as uh, a ratio between uh, the energies of a final state particle relative to the initial one, or it could be the ratio of uh, the um, of a transit of, of a longitudinal momenta, or it could be the ratios of a light cone momenta. At the level, at the logarithmic level of accuracy at which uh, we are working, either of these choice is equivalent. And one of, the, uh, one of the directions in which people go in trying to improve these algorithms is to identify what is the choice that more closely simulates the effect of introducing corrections which go beyond the leading logarithmic uh, corrections. Very often this can be done without having to do the full calculation at next to leading log, but simply by selecting properly the kinematical variables. And likewise for this uh, momentum Q, the virtuality scale of a branching, it can be taken as the transverse momentum of one relative to the other or the invariant mass of, uh, of the object. 
this is what I said here. So how do we use these uh, probabilities? <coughs> so if we start from a given scale and we have this parton, the possible histories are that nothing happens. It, sta it was emitted and it doesn't radiate, it stays uh, without emitting, or it emits one branch and then subsequently that one branch can emit itself or it can stay. And the other branch can emit subsequent times and each of the particles that emerge can themselves uh, uh, branch. So we have uh, really this uh, Markov uh, chain and for each of these uh, histories we can attach uh, a probability which is built uh, through these uh, uh, emission probabilities. And at the end of the day you can sum over all of the possible uh, histories since they are all uh, uncorrelated one from, from the other, the only correlation, the only interference is due to the angular ordering, which means that when we do these, uh, these integrals over phase space, we just have to incorporate in the boundary condition for in the extremes of the integral, we have to incorporate the geometric constraint of the angular ordering. That's the way it's done. But at the end of the day, we have an expression which is uh, given by P0 for the total probability of something happening which must be equal to one, we have this overall P0 times something that exponent shades, and by setting this equal to one, we get this P0, which is the probability of nothing happening, of a particle staying like that without uh, radiating, which is the exponent of minus the integral dq squared over q squared of the splitting function times alpha s. And the integral is done from some uh, infrared cut of lambda all the way up to uh, the scale uh, Q0. So this is the scale that defines, uh, that defines uh, the initial, uh, the beginning of the evolution. And this is the probability that nothing happens starting from Q0 down to the scale lambda. If I were to take lambda equals to zero, I would obtain that the probability is uh, zero because uh, like in the case of this is what was done by Nima the other day, the probability that an accelerated electron does not radiate radiation all the way down to zero energy, the probability that zero photons are emitted is absolutely, is absolutely zero. Now in the case of QCD, we cannot anyway go beyond uh, a given uh, a given threshold, a given infrared cutoff, because below a given cutoff, the evolution of a shower has to stop because then we have to come in with the hadronization done in a phenomenological uh, way. So we're going to match the value of this, I call it lambda because it reminds us of lambda QCD, but it's a scale of the order of a GV. This is the point at which the perturbative evolution in the shower stops. And the numerical algorithm proceeds uh, simply as follows. <coughs> this is uh, the, the Sudakov uh, expression, starting from a given scale uh, uh, Q, the probability of no radiation between Q and lambda or any scale is given by, is given by, by that. So <coughs> if I start from Q, this is the probability that my state producer Q will not radiate. I generate, I want to see whether it radiates or not. I have a given event. I want to start the shower. I want to build up this probabilistic uh, Markov chain. I throw a random number between zero and one. If this number is smaller than the Sudakov between Q and lambda, which means the probability that indeed nothing happens between uh, the scale and the infrared cutoff, if I, the random number is in this region, that's exactly what happens. My event does not radiate. So I put my quark, it doesn't emit, and I turn it at a scale lambda, and I leave it there till I've <coughs> um, evolved to the rest of the event, and we'll come back to it for the hadronization. If instead uh, the number xi, the random number I generate, is bigger, than this one, for example, it's Xi1. You see Xi1 intercepts a scale. So this is the value of the scale at which the Sudakov, which corresponds to the Sudakov. Hmm? 
So this is a scale at which there has been an emission. So I have now a transition between my initial particle at a scale Q to a branching with a final state particle at scale Q1. And I will use uh, P of Z, the splitting function, to extract uh, in, in, a, in a way distributed according to PZ the value of the kinematics of the final state. So exactly how the splitting takes place. And I can decide whether the splitting goes to a quark gluon as opposed to glue glue, depending on, on what the, the flavors of the object I'm dealing with are. So I reconstruct the full kinematics of the splitting. And at this point, I am at the scale Q1. So I start again. I throw another random number. If the random number is smaller than uh, Xi1, it means that there is no further emission and my object goes on shell. If it's bigger than Xi1, I have another emission at this scale. I define the kinematics of the emission and I start from ag again. I throw another number, random number. If it's below Xi2, the evolution is over. I, I stop at the cutoff. Otherwise, I emit. And you see that very quickly, I will be, I will be converging, okay? Of course, if I start from very, very, very far away, I will have room for many, many emissions. If I start already at a scale which is close to the cutoff scale, most likely there will not be room for, for emissions. So this is the way that uh, the algorithm is, uh, is built. And then when everything, when I apply this to every single uh, leg in the final, in the final state of the, of the hard process, I just go back to the, what we said before, namely to the, to the hadronization. I turn, I put together carol single clusters, I let them hadronize, etc. Now, the important thing to remember is that uh, since there is a cutoff, the cutoff is of the order of a GV, there will always unavoidably be a probability different from zero that the particle does not radiate. So I have a plus e minus going to QQ bar and uh, with a probability which is the Sudakov square, neither the quark nor the anti-quark will radiate. They just go, if you wish, on shell at the cutoff. And at this point, it's a problem because I have this QQ bar pair which are not allowed to radiate any longer, which I'm supposed to handle like a color single cluster that has to hadronize. And if that pair has an invariant mass of say 100 GV or 1000 GV because that's the energy at which I'm working, I'm supposed to turn this 1000 GV object into pions. And there is obviously, this just doesn't make any sense, right? So I mean, I can do it, I can invent some model to do it, but. I have no chance of describing this uh, accurately. So this is one of the limitations. But here we're talking about, you know, that Sudakov square is, you know, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7. We're talking about an infinitesimally small fraction of the final state of the plus e minus. However, it is a fraction that could be relevant because, for example, in the days in preparation for the LHC, people were calculating the backgrounds to Higgs going to gamma gamma. And one of the backgrounds is dijet production where the two jets fragment into a single, I mean, a photon. But if it happens on both sides for both jets, I have a diphoton final state. And that can happen if I have a quark that fragments into just a single pi zero, and the pi zero decays to two photons. So that is really one of these cases in which uh, there, is, there is no uh, activity, not almost no gluon radiation, the multiplicity of a jet at the end is very small, it's of order one, uh, and these events emerge in the shower uh, <coughs> approach by simply hitting these uh, configurations where no gluon is emitted. And clearly for these events, we don't know how to make uh, predictions. So the t another way of saying is that there is no way we can calculate in this formalism the fragmentation functions in the region where z goes to one because the region where z goes to one, it's too close to, it's fully dominated by the non-perturbative physics and, uh, and our, and this phenological approach uh, can never get it right. Okay, without going into any details, but this is just to summarize <coughs> uh, this whole framework when put in place, 
and when one uses the approach I mentioned before, namely to use experiments at a given energy in order to fit uh, the parameters of the non-perturbative description, and then one uses them at higher energy, one can make predictions. And these are predictions, for example, for multiplicities of uh, hadrons of different types observed in uh, Z decays. So E plus E minus going to a Z decays, this was done at LEP. And you see here, we go through photons by zeros, rows, uh, charge pions, uh, kaons, omegas, phi's, all of the baryonic resonances, uh, including objects like omega minuses, plus uh, heavy flavor mesons, D's, B's, J psi's. And this is uh, what is measured, and this is what uh, you obtain from a model like the one I described before, say Herwig doing the shower plus implementing the hadronization. And you don't have to go through all of the numbers. The numbers where you see an asterisk next to it are the numbers which are off by, I believe, two or 2.5 sigma, it's written some place. Yeah, three sigma. So there is a limited number of places where the prediction is off by more than three sigma, and it's always very complicated final states, like for example, the J psi. The J psi, it's a CC bar bound state, so, and it's heavy. So it's hard to imagine that one with those cluster models, which are based on physics at the GeV scale, one can properly estimate the J psi multiplicity that has to be done by incorporating the matrix element for the production of the, of the J psi, the J psi is efficiently a hard uh, particle. So this is the overall, uh, the overall uh, framework and scenario. And as I said, that's what we use now at the LHC very successfully as a way of uh, turning the quarks and gluons into, into hadrons. So tomorrow, I will, uh, I will show you, we, we will change a bit now that we, you have this general background. And I think I will discuss uh, some of the important measurements that are being done or will have to be done uh, in, uh, in the future with the data and some of the complexities that arise when we start looking at uh, more complex final states, for example, final states with, with multi-jets, where jets, uh, as you saw from here, everything is based on the soft gluon approximation. So this approach can only describe correctly emission of soft gluons. When there is hard gluon emission, one has to use different techniques and one has to go directly through the calculation of the matrix elements. So I, I will uh, uh, show to you some of the difficulties and the issues that emerge uh, tackling those problems.